I am. So, um, as you can see here, I've uh, got the chat up and uh, it will be in the video. Um, and I'm also showing a slideshow. One of our followers, uh, Arcadian Wings, uh, created some very beautiful memes with Carl Jung quotes on them. So uh, you'll be seeing these uh, scroll past during this session. Okay, I guess we're live. Uh, if if uh, anyone is here, it would be very helpful to me if you would uh, start to say something uh, in chat, uh, so that I know that you're you're watching. Hi, Shea. Thank you for uh, responding to that. Okay, <laughs> um, this is going to be very interesting because today I've learned some uh, new technologies so um, I'm going to feel like pretty much like a one-man band today and um, <laughs> uh, because I'm using this technology for the first time or actually I'm using it for the third time but it's um, it's challenging to get everything I want uh, into the video and uh, so we'll see how it works. One of the things that I'm going to do is um, play a video bit by bit with comments and questions on it. Hi, Jerome. How are you? Nice to see you. Hi, Samuel. Nice to see you also. Uh, I hope you're seeing the chat on the uh, YouTube channel. I have so many windows open right now. Uh, that I simply cannot be looking at everything. Um, get that out of there. At least I can get some things out of my way. Um, and let's get into this. Just a moment. just want to get my um, index up so that if I have to refer to any uh, video that I've already done I, I'll be able to get the URL for it um, let's see here. almost almost there and Studio. Okay, I guess I'm ready to go now. Um, so anyway, uh, individuation is a big task to talk about because it's uh, very complicated. And uh, as I say, I apologize for being a one-man band, but let me see if I can uh, make some changes here and. Um, there, there's a pomegranate. Uh, I hope you're seeing that. If you're not seeing it, let me know. <laughs> um, Dr. Jung's work is very comprehensive and, and very deep, as I'm sure many of you know. Anybody that's watching this right now certainly knows that. And so it's impossible to read his work like a novel. If you picked up personality types, um, which I have here, and personality types has a, let's see, yeah, I'll get used to showing things opposite. <laughs> Come on. Uh, there, okay, there. Okay, I'm looking at per personality types, 
and in personality types, which is volume six of the collected works, um, there is a definition section, which is about uh, 200 pages long. <laughs> and uh, so it's very challenging. And today I'm going to be working with the definition of individuation, uh, which is only, um, only a page and a half long. Uh, but I'm going to be talking about 10 major points uh, in that uh, work and um, and in that way I hope to let you taste some of the kernels in this pomegranate. Now Dr. Young was always talking about symbols and the word individuation is really a symbol for um, all the concepts that are in the pomegranate here and so each one if you think of each one of those little pomegranate seeds as a as a juicy tidbit of information uh, then um, you have an idea of the psychological fact the psychic fact that Dr. Jung is trying to express and so um, let's see I seem to have lost my way here. <laughs> okay. Okay. I had an index. <laughs> I had an outline here, but I seem to have managed to get it off the screen, so I'm not going to keep you while I find it. Um, but uh, first of all, let's talk about the idea that um, Dr. Jung thinks of um, as a human being as something like an oak tree. Uh, and so when, we, um, when we're born, we already have everything in us that is going to make us uh, perform through life. And uh, while every oak tree is the same, everyone is also different. Uh, and so they grow up and you can recognize them as an oak tree, but you won't find two oak trees the same. Well, it's quite the same with individuals. And so the... Um, let's see. So... What I want to do now is I want to see if I can play this video and, and this will be um, this will be the starting of the definition. Um, oh boy, what did I do here? Oh. Oh my goodness, somehow I managed to get myself uh, off the track here, so that's not the way I wanted to do that. Let me, I have to get that back. Um, just a moment. All right. Now, let's, let's see if I can get this working right now. Okay, uh, I hope that you're hearing this and seeing, whoops, wait a minute. I hope you're seeing this video now and if you're not seeing it could you tell me and also if you're not hearing it I'm gonna stop it for a moment I'm gonna move it to the starting point for the reading um, and uh, okay so uh, here I'm going to be reading um, the very beginning of Dr. Jung's description here. 
Uh, so this will be the first paragraph. It's paragraph 757 of personality types. Oh. You're not hearing this, Jerome? Do you hear it now? See if I can get the uh, now. If I so I've done that. This uh, can you hear? Can you hear me? Okay, you hear me, but not the sound from the video. I'm going to try to play the sound. I'm going to play the sound of the video into the room, or try to. That's not working. Uh, nope. Okay, best laid plans. All right. Um, well, so as not to keep everyone on this issue, um, let me, um, I'll, I'll simply read these portions. Um, let me, uh, let me get my mic going again, make sure my mic is going. Um, let's see. Okay, it's, it's a short portion, so it won't take very long. Um, let's see what I got here. Advanced audio. All right, so I'm I'm going to uh, um, I'm assuming you are hearing me. Okay, um, so I'm taking from Samuel that you hear me, um, but. You didn't hear the video. I'm sorry for that. I'll try to figure out what's wrong with that over time here. So uh, the first segment of this um, definition of individuation is uh, in paragraph 757, and it reads as follows. The concept of individuation plays a large role in our psychology. In general, it is the process by which individual beings are formed and differentiated. In particular, it is a development of the psychological individual as a being distinct from the general. Collective psychology. It, as being distinct from the general collective psychology. Individuation, therefore, is a process of differentiation having for its goal the development of the individual personality. So, um, so in this first segment, uh, Dr. Jung is talking about the points that I raised about the oak tree and um, and I guess that's uh, the main point I wanted to raise for now. So um, let me go on with the next piece. Uh, I'm reading from paragraph 758, but there's going to be three segments 
or Ernode, yeah, three segments in this paragraph 758. So the beginning is, individuation is a natural necessity inasmuch as its prevention by a leaven by a leveling down to collective standards is injurious to the vital activity of the individual. Since individuality is a prior psychological and physiological datum, it also expresses itself in psychological ways. Any serious check to the individuality, therefore, is an artificial stunting it is obvious that a social group consisting of stunted in individuals cannot be a healthy and viable institution. Well, yes and no. <laughs> um, first of all, I wanted to um, point out my friends in the Marine Corps. So let me I'll just uh, get them going for you. And so in the Marine Corps, we have uh, the Marine Corps builds men. Well, and women, it turns out, also now. <laughs> and, uh, and I've known a few women Marines, and they are just as tough as the men are. There's no doubt about that. Um, but when you're built as a Marine, you're uh, no longer totally free to do whatever you want. Uh, I, I have uh, an image in my mind of um, of some some old Marines or old soldiers who have left their service and and uh, now they're growing a beard and that sort of thing, and um, uh, that's what happens. Um, but the issue is is this issue um, when you're when you're getting people ready for, um, oops, no, not that one, this one, just a moment. So as I said, oak trees will grow, but so will bonsai. And um, the way you create a bonsai tree is you trim it back until it meets your standard for beauty in a very t tiny way. But when you have an oak bonsai tree, it actually is an oak. So as long as you keep trimming it, it will say, stay small and beautiful in your house, but it's a living creature just like any other plant. And so bonsai trees are happiest if they're outside, at least in temperate weather. And if you let them go, if you don't keep uh, trimming them, um, they will grow wild and become a full-size oak tree. Um, and so, um, but, but creating a bonsai tree is this artificial stunting I'm talking. <coughs> I'm talking about. And, uh, in, and, that's what happens in the Marine Corps as well, where we are artificially taking these young men and women who um, are from various races, uh, sexes, religious groups, and we're turning them into one collective that operates in a certain fashion. Now, once you learn to be a Marine, um, it's like, it's something like, uh, what I learned was Zen, which is, uh, when you learn to type, uh, you have to look at the keys and f figure out how to put your, uh, fingers on the right letters. But when you practiced a bit, uh, you no longer have to do that. So probably none of us that are watching this video uh, ever think about typing w what letter is where. We just type. And so that's a, a Zen, that's a bodily knowledge of being a typist. Uh, the same thing applies to uh, riding a bicycle. As long as you have to think about how to balance your bicycle or um, 
steer or pedal, you can't ride a bicycle. But as soon as you can forget about that, then you can ride a bicycle. And the Marine Corps is much more complex than either of those activities, but it's something that once learned, you know for life. I can assure you of that. And this is why uh, all Marines, even old Marines like me, call ourselves Marines, even though we haven't been on active duty for, in my case, uh, 28 years. Um, I have had my uniform on a few times, but I uh, haven't been on active duty. And so, um, but this artificial stunting uh, is what causes us to be a bicycle rider or a typist or what have you, or a Marine. Um, and but obviously you couldn't have a whole society of Marines because after a while it would just get too weird. <laughs> people, people, um, there's no, nobody that wants to fight a war, but basically someone has to know how, and that's my perspective of it. And, uh, because if you don't know how, somebody else will know how, and they're going to take your lunch away from you. And so, um, when we create collective standards, as Dr. Jung is talking about here, uh, we're being forced into a certain collective activity, um, and, and that is a leveling down of the individual. And... Uh, it's not the way you would grow naturally. Now, so uh, let me stop now at this point and ask if there's any question about what I've said so far. Okay, I'm not seeing anything. Um, and so in that case, I will uh, continue on and we can go back to the questions uh, as we go forward, so don't feel you have to put off another question. Um, but I'm going to take the Marines out of there for now, and I'm going to go on to the third point, which is uh, actually a continuation of that sentence. Only a society that can preserve its internal cohesion and collective values, while at the same time granting the individual the greatest possible freedom, has any prospect of an enduring vitality. And so uh, an example of a society that uh, can grant individual freedoms while maintaining its cohesion uh, is the United States. And here we have uh, the Women's March, which went on yesterday. And um, even though we have great disagreements between us as Americans, uh, we're able to show our disagreement uh, without violence most of the time. Um, that's not always true, but it also was true mostly in Occupy Wall Street, um, where uh, we occupied and showed our dissatisfaction, uh, but we uh, mostly didn't have any uh, violence whatsoever. But the violence that did occur was relatively mild in terms of police action. Here's this picture as an example of that. Um, and, um, but, you know, we have to have that vitality. And so the dynamism of the United States is that we're able uh, to dissent, to disagree, and yet we have people from every uh, race, religion, cultural group, nationality um, in the world lives here as Americans. And it all works because uh, our society has cohesion. Um, some people think it's threatened right now. Uh, I don't think that that is the case um, because, um, because the country is much deeper and stronger than any one man or group of men. Um, and, but an example of a society where that's not the case 
uh, is um, is uh, Turkey, and where the Ge Gezi uh, Park demonstrations went on, and there um, society couldn't maintain its cohesion, and you saw some really horrific uh, pictures from the Gezi Park demonstrations. Um, I happen to have a personal group of friends uh, who were uh, down in the action there, and uh, it was not pretty. Um, and the problem with that is that Turkey has been bolted down as a society and so therefore it has much less dynamism than the United States and people don't understand um, why the United States sort of um, uh, floated up to the top of all countries on earth at least in terms of economics and in terms of uh, military strength but it's it's explicitly that dynamism and the ability to hold the society together without doing the types of things that happened in Gezi Park that makes that possible. Uh, let's see what other questions uh, Lady Shea. So the question she's asking is, isn't the artificial stunting in training to be a Marine similar to the stunting of social norms, only stricter? Is it possible that some personality types thrive more in such an environment? Uh, certainly, I agree that that's true. 95% um, of all generals and admirals in the U.S. military uh, let's say up to the major general or rear admiral level are STJ uh, in terms of the Myers-Briggs type indicator. That is, they're uh, sensing, they're thinking, and they're judging. If you come to the military and those aren't your uh, characteristics, you can be introverted or extroverted. That's no problem. But if you come to the military without those being your ca characteristics, uh, you have a harder time. And so in my case, because I'm an NTP, I was different in two of those three uh, spectra. And um, I'm going to take Gezi Park off the screen now, but, um, and so, um, uh, I did have to have my intuitive freedom stunted at some, in some sense when I was doing my preliminary training. Uh, but uh, there is good news for people like me, although it would be more for a person who is a, a NTJ, who's intuitive, um, thinking and judging. And examples of that are people that make it to vice admiral or admiral or lieutenant general or general, uh, three or four stars. Uh, and the perfect example would be uh, Colin Powell is a typical example of that in the U.S. military, where the SD, STJ types are very good in the field, getting something done. And this is why they rise to... Uh, high to two stars, let's say. But then when you get up to three and four stars, now you're talking about things that require political um, savvy, let's say. And so most of the generals and admirals that I know that have been commandants of the Marine Corps, and in my class we've had, um, I don't know, four or five chiefs of naval operations, and at least uh, a couple of a couple, three commandants of the Marine Corps who were in my class or within a year or two of my class. Um, and all of those men that I know uh, were not STJ. They were definitely intuitive people who could handle uh, the political environment. Uh, whether 
they were probably J because you have to get a lot of details done in a in a judging kind of way in the military, but uh, maybe not. It's hard to know on that last point. Uh, let's see. Well, well, so is it possible that some personality types thrive more in such an environment while others would be damaged by it? Uh, yes, I think that that's quite true. And there's just, if we take uh, uh, U.S. military OCS for Marine Corps anyway, um, about 30% of the men and women who come to officer candidate school don't make it. They drop out. Uh, most of them uh, leave by their own request, but occasionally we um, separate them for one reason or another. Um, so happened that I was a uh, uh, training instructor at Officer Candidate School, and I had one uh, candidate who wanted to cheat um, on things like uh, athletic activities like running. And uh, if you're a Marine, you have to run. And he wanted to cheat. And so we had this running thing where he had to go around five times. And uh, I was put on notice when he came around the first time. Uh, and I noticed that he was sort of near the back of the pack. And we had one young officer candidate who was a part Native American, and he could fly. He could run like the wind. And so he was out in front of the group, and this other candidate who wanted to cheat was about halfway back in the back. And I didn't see him the next three times around, but on the final time around, uh, he finished like second or third in the group. So he came in right behind um, the young man who was just flying around this course. And it made me very suspicious because I knew he wasn't that fast and he had had problems with his legs during the uh, training and so on. So I started to ask around and uh, the other candidates uh, said, oh yeah, he just went in the woods and waited for us to finish. So, um, so obviously he wasn't uh, cut out for it. And as I say, nearly a third of everybody who thinks they can become a Marine officer actually leaves before they even try to get through the program. Um, so wouldn't the question further is, wouldn't the trick be to balance it out, to be able to retain your individuality within the conformity of the rules, whether it's in the Marine Corps or society? Uh, yes, we're coming to that issue in a moment, but certainly what Dr. Young said is, first you have to learn the minimum rules. And so in the Marine Corps, uh, you know, there's certain standards. And if, if you're not going to meet that uh, minimum standard, then nobody's ever going to call you a Marine. Um, and... Um, But then beyond that, you can be somewhat of an individual. And for example, uh, some people are drawn to different uh, occupation specialties. Um, I was originally uh, drawn to the artillery, but my main reason to join the artillery was that um, it would allow me to have an opportunity to get into language school, uh, which I did. And so... I, in my intuitive way, I had a, uh, a flair for language, it turned out. And so I went to artillery school and then uh, my payback for never having to, for my payback for being the top Marine in my army artillery class was that I never had to touch another artillery piece in my life, in my career. Um, and, uh, so, uh, so there are other things, you know, more 
chances for being an individual uh, by different military occupational specialties. And my final military occupational specialty for about 15 years was as a, as a judge advocate general, a lawyer in the Marines. Um, but I had served in uh, the combat arms first. Um, okay, libido tuxedo. What are some good career paths for INFP? Uh, let me think about that a moment. Mm -hmm. Well, I think um, possibly working in uh, things that involve more emotion, um, things like um, you know, you know, working with the SPCA, uh, for example, um, where um, where you're taking care of animals and the issue we all have as we have careers and career paths though is that ultimately uh, we end up having to be in an administrative role okay we might uh, be in the field doing a career path like um, like uh, like helping the SPCA as an example, um, but once you've been taking care of the dogs and cats for 10 or 20 years, you're, you will have been around and there will be younger people coming in behind you and someone is going to ask you uh, to take an administrative role and because you're the only one that knows what's going on and so that's what happens in every career path. Uh, but, you know, other things, you could look at the um, uh, nonprofit sector, as we call it in the United States, or the, uh, let's see, what is it called overseas? Um, I don't recall the name uh, just offhand, but uh, anyway, in the, in the U.S., it's, uh, it would be the nonprofit sector, um, because then, as a P, you don't have... If you're in those kinds of sectors, you're less likely to have somebody yelling at you. Uh, for example, my, work, my wife works for the hospice, and so a very large percentage of that staff is women uh, taking care of patients who are dying, and uh, it requires a special uh, talent of compassion, and uh, she's perfect for that. She's an I in her case, she's an INTJ though, so she's making sure that uh, the nonprofit that she works for is uh, minding its P's and Q's with, with respect to uh, nonprofit law as an example. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Okay, Everett, well, what did Jung mean by saying it's impossible to converse with Animus for five minutes without becoming victim of his own anima. Um, all right, well, this, th that's really not on this topic, but uh, in response, let me say that I think that if you're responding to an archetype, you have archetypes within you as well. And so archetypes tend to be bombastic and uh, so if, if a woman's animus is coming through, for example, which is, would have been the case uh, that Dr. Jung was dealing with, um, and mostly I'm talking about hetero, heterosexual people here, so, but if a woman's animus is dealing with him, it may be somewhat rigid and so on, and um, his anima um, would uh, would archetypally respond to that. I think that's what he's saying. Um, you know, you, he used to have a comment that you know the animus draws its sword and the and the anima spreads her poison, <laughs> uh, and. Um, so they tend to react to one another, and, and it's best if you know when this is happening within yourself so that you don't get yourself 
in a intransigent argument that is not soluble because if if um, if the animus of let's say the animus of Emma Young started to get angry with Carl, um, he his anima would certainly respond. Uh, I guess that's the best way I could explain that. Uh, Jerome says NFs are enthusiastic and insightful understanding and communicating with people. Um, behavioral science literature and art teaching. Um, right. Um, I think those are, that's uh, a good piece of advice also. Obviously, um, uh, teaching. Um, many women uh, who are heavily F's tend to, tend to uh, become teachers. Uh, and thank goodness for that because we need teachers. <laughs> so anyway, um, so let me go on with the next section here. Um, so continuing on with paragraph 758, as the individual is not just a single separate being, but by his very existence <clears throat> presupposes a collective relationship, it follows that the process of individuation must lead to more intense and broader collective relationships and not to isolation. So uh, I think we would have, I mean, the point is that individuation is supposed to make you a better citizen, not more of a uh, malcontent or uh, a hermit, let's say. Uh, the purpose of uh, individuation is not only to make you an individual, but to make you an individual of whatever society you're a part of. And it's not intended to make you, you know, the hermit card or on the tarot, or um, we have a area around Washington, D.C. Uh, called Cabin John. And um, Cabin John is the name of a man who lived up about 10 miles north of Georgetown, based back when 10 miles was a long distance. And so he never came out of his cabin. And so to this day, and this is probably 250 to 300 years later, uh, they still call the area Cabin John because that's where he as a hermit lived. But he, you know, arguably he could have been individuated. I don't know anything about him, but uh, more likely he was simply a misanthrope and therefore not part of society. And um, I think that it's, um, I think it's interesting to watch the individual, the individuation of the President of the United States um, because he obviously came in with um, shortcomings in his individuation process. And uh, he seems to be making himself more and more uh, isolated. And rather than learn from the mistakes that he's made in this year, he keeps doubling down, which that obviously worked well for him while he was, um, while he could control everything with his money. Um, but once he got into an organization where his money doesn't buy compliance, uh, he's now having difficulty and it seems he's moving into isolation. So that wouldn't be an ideal type of individuation from Dr. Young's point of, point of view. Okay. Uh, Jerome says, uh, you will see where some of these norms are inhibiting your particular development but you can learn to deal with them while continuing your role in living your everyday life. Uh, well, this is certainly true, and and part of part of the process of individuation um, is learning where you fit in best and 
what is in you because Dr. Jung mentioned um, Dr. Jung mentioned uh, that you know it's in the DNA you you're born with whatever it is now, where is that word? picture here that I was going to share with you, but I seem to have lost it. Where did it go? Ah, yes, here we are. Okay. Okay, so um, I, I like to use as an example of this um, Michelangelo's David and um, his, his uh, image has become modest on the internet I found um, so we can't see the entire image um, but if you think about David David was in a block of marble that was huge it weighed something like 15 tons and Italian workmen brought it into um, Florence uh, in and put it next to a cathedral and David was in there in this block of marble all that time uh, 50 it sat next to this cathedral for 54 years and two other sculptors made a start on the block of marble I don't know what they were trying to carve out of it but my, Michelangelo obviously saw David in the block of marble he knew that it, David was in there. And so he began to chip away at it. And so our individuation is something like that. We have within us the beautiful creature that we're ultimately going to have been in our lifetime. Uh, nobody's going to know how beautiful until after we're gone, but um, but in order to find the image of David or uh, Venus de Milo within you, um, there have to be a lot of chips taken out of the marble. And this happens uh, by society. They're the slings and arrows of life. And so this is why the so-called Job archetype is very important to understand because uh, and if you're new here let me just uh, put it down on the chat it's contest defeat lamentation rebirth okay and so what Dr. Jung finally realized in his answer when he was doing his answer to Job is that this is a fundamental archetype for how we develop our lives and um, and we have to go through this cycle many times and I didn't understand the point that James Hillman made on a tape I, re I listened to maybe 25 years ago but he's he made the comment can't we find a defeat in here somewhere <laughs> and and his point was that defeats whatever they are um, and they can be very painful obviously taking a chip out of your marble can be very painful uh, <clears throat> but uh, they're necessary in order to get to the good stuff and so when when something painful happens to you, then, you know, you, I really urge you to lament as briefly as possible and, and then uh, go on to what's next in your life. And the thing about it is we have this inner drive. We have a drive for life. I think that that's part of this uh, idea. And with the drive for life, comes a drive to become uh, what you are intended to become. What is the meaning of your life? Probably the best question you can ask yourself is, what is the meaning of your life? Um, and it, we probably ought to ask that question every day. And 
if we run into a defeat, which happens to all of us all the time, if we run into the def a defeat, then we have to find how we're going to work around it. Uh, you know, let's just take it as an example, um, grasses that are, uh, you know, grasses are growing up wildly in, the, in your lawn, but if somebody puts a uh, stone on top of the grass, well, the grass won't grow there, but it'll certainly come up around the stone and find another way uh, to live. And so we all have this uh, will and drive to live and to become, and to become the, the oak tree that we were intended to be. Um, and uh, let me put the oaks back up here. So, you know, ultimately you were intended to be uh, some kind of oak tree. It was in your seed from the very beginning and uh, society is going to be one influence on in shaping you, uh, but it's not the only influence. Uh, you yourself are an influence, of course, and so on. And so the question is, um, you know, it's it's something like the Army's uh, motto, be all you can be. It, it happens that I know the officer that came up with that motto, and he was a Jungian. <laughs> and uh, believe it or not, his name was Frank Burns, uh, and he was a colonel. Um, but anyway, uh, Frank came up with this motto, be all you can be, and that's got to be the motto for every human being. Um, and so let me see. Uh, and, all right, so le let me take Samuel Elkin's question. Could you apply individuation to a group to the United States, for exa example? Uh, yes, of course. And every group has a certain uh, individuation about it. Um, and uh, obviously the United States, um, people who become Americans, even, even immigrants who become Americans, um, they're no longer you know, Indian or Malaysian or whatever they uh, might have been originally. Once they become Americans, um, in my for my lights, they're uh, among the best Americans because they understand what they gave up to become Americans and they understand the value of what we have here. And certainly that grew up through an individuation process for the whole country. It's happening again, obviously. We have a great uh, duality within our country. Right now, our shadow side has um, emerged, we'd say erupted uh, in the last year. And so it remains to be seen how as a country we will be, let's say five years from now. But my guess is it won't be very much different from what it was uh, before 2016. Uh, I'll give you an example in my lifetime was um, the um, sexual revolution of the late 1960s. Uh, I really missed that because my class, <clears throat> my class in college was the last class of the Victorian era, uh, the class of 1968. But um, after that, because uh, society had gotten so unruly, because people were so angry about the Vietnam War, um, we we had free love for three or four or five years. I'm not exactly sure how long, but by the time I got out of the Marine Corps and went to law school in 1972, it was pretty much over. Um, and the country went back to being <clears throat> pretty much like the country that it had been <clears throat> before the Vietnam demonstrations began. Um, 
So Everett, uh, why do you think Jung got so focused on alchemy later in his life? And why is it meaningful to read his works on this subject? Is alchemy helpful in the practical way for personal growth? Um, <clears throat> yes, very much so. Let me explain here with, <clears throat> with some graphic I prepared. And let me get rid of the oak trees. Just a minute. Okay. So, first of all, uh, I, I want to show you the, the yin and yang symbol. And basically, this represents uh, how duality is. Du there's always duality, and in duality is where our psychic energy happens. And um, things move back and forth between the opposites. So this is why I'm not terribly concerned about the health of the country in the long term or in the midterm even, because uh, I know that things will swing back at some point. Um, but then as we go forward, um, the things get more complicated. Now this is where alchemy is coming in because there's many issues within issues within issues and um, think of that circle is the world we live in and um, and so Dr. Jung was looking at the psyche as a certain complexity and so then we get to this symbol uh, which shows you um, in a bit broader, uh, to a broader extent, uh, how things are dualistic in many different dimensions. And so the psyche is like that. It's much more complicated than even this image is. I mean, there are literally thousands of dualities within our psyche. And, um, and we, You know, we can't look at every single one of them, but our happiness or our depression or whatever our feelings are at the current moment, for example, uh, our emotions are all a, a combination of that. And the alchemical gold that the alchemist used to refer to, which is what everybody seems to know about the gold of alchemy. <laughs> um, but, but the alchemists were really chemists and they were also early psychologists. And Dr. Jung discovered this um, in uh, probably in the mid 19 teens and studied it very, very uh, great detail. Uh, for many years uh, before he started to write about it. And then in about uh, 19, I guess, 40, we had uh, the first of his alchemy books. But he was talking about it for many years before that. And it turns out that uh, the book called Psychology and Alchemy is really a history of the human psyche going back thousands of years. That's what it really is about. And so the alchemists were, were early psychologists who were working with trying to understand what makes a society work and what doesn't make a society work. Uh, I hope that that's a, sort of an early uh, and quick response on alchemy. I wasn't really planning to discuss alchemy today, but, um, but obviously I do believe that alchemy, understanding what alchemy is and how it works, um, is very useful to your future. Because uh, I had a mentor once that said, uh, every time we add someone to a group or take someone away from a group, the group changes. And that's definitely true. And, and that's an alchemical activity because you a lot of that change happens unconsciously 
Um, so let's see. Um, there's a web con comic called Scandinavia and the and the world that is was wonderfully captured the essence of different nature nations individual identities. Yes, there there are a number of great uh, uh, web let's say takes on what makes us different, whether we're different uh, nationalities or whether our countries are different or even, you know, even our different services are quite different. I mean, uh, certainly there's a, I believe there's a big difference between a Marine and a soldier and uh, certainly a even bigger difference between uh, a Marine and a, uh, and a Navy sailor. Um, it so happens that I grew up in the Navy. My father was a Naval officer, so I uh, can live in both camps, but I certainly know the differences between the two camps as well. <clears throat> uh, so I'm glad, uh, I'm glad that helped you on alchemy. So now let me um, go on to the next um, section. Let's see. Um, this lead to more intense. Okay, we did that. So point number five is uh, individuation is closely connected with the transcendent function. Since this function creates individual lines of development, which could never be reached by keeping to the path prescribed by collective norms. So what Dr. Jung is talking about here is the ego self axis and the fact that the self is uh, also referred to by him and unions as the God image. Okay. And that is at the most basic level of the human psyche. And I think you remember I flashed it from last time, but let me um, show this one more. Okay, here we are. That, <clears throat> that diagram by Edward Edinger um, basically talks about the layers of the psyche and the lowest layer is the self, and that is the most basic archetype. And um, Marie-Louise von Franz, who was one of Jung's first generation disciples, um, did a lot of work on fairy tales around the world. <clears throat> and she says that <clears throat> in the end, all fairy tales are about the self, the, the self archetype. And then above this, I haven't figured out how to do a pointer on, uh, on this, but um, above it is the anim and animus. So that's like uh, the red or blue color glasses that you're looking through and the uh, two little circles on the, on the outside uh, in this diagram are men and women. And so uh, men may are looking through anima colored glasses, uh, rose colored glasses, perhaps, and women are looking through uh, blue colored glasses out at the world, but it's actually the self that's doing that. And then in the center, um, you see the shadow, uh, which comes down from the ego. So, um, I hope that's helpful. Um, but anyway, the point is getting to the self and understanding the self is incredibly important to understand everything about yourself um, or everything about your own psychology. And it's it's inbred, it's innate in everyone. It come, it manifests differently in the sense that every oak tree manifests differently. But if you're going to get to the depth of what 
drives you, then you need to transcend uh, this barrier between the conscious and the unconscious mind. And you have to understand when the conscious mind, or I'm sorry, when, when you are penetrating through to the unconscious mind. And the unconscious mind tends to be a realm of emotion and, uh, and of the soul. And so and Dr. Jung considered himself a um, doctor of the soul. And so, um, let me uh, give an example. Uh, recently, the last two years, there's been a, a television series called The Crown. And it's about the British royal family. It's quite good. It's going to be six seasons. So far, there have been two that have been published. And it takes the life of uh, Elizabeth II through from <clears throat> just before she became queen uh, until, as of now, the, the series is uh, up to about 1972 or three in her life. There are going to be four more seasons, so it'll carry through all of the events of her life. But it's very interesting. and. Um, I don't know why, but I know that I find that program very soulful and very comforting to watch. So I know that there's something in my unconscious that likes the environment and the events of that uh, program. And in a way, you can also see uh, through that program the events that are explored in the Tarot. And so it would benefit you to under, to know the Tarot. I've now done 20 videos to train people for their own uses, for their own use, not to become a, um, a gypsy, but to understand your own psyche. Because the Tarot works to break through to your unconscious. But Beyond that, I can see the cards of the Tarot coming up in those various uh, uh, programs from the Crown. And there's another series that uh, I've only looked at the first season so far, and that's uh, Victoria, uh, which was, is about Queen Victoria. And I find that very soulful as well. So, you know, I don't know why. It's unconscious, but I definitely am attracted to that. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay, so um, so in other words, we're back on this issue that was point number five, which is that it's connected with transcendence, and so. One of the things that Jungian analysts want you to do is reflect on these things. And so I have been reflecting on my interest in those programs and trying to understand why I'm starting to make progress, obviously, when I can make analogies to the Tarot. Um, and that transcends so that I understand why my unconscious uh, likes to watch that program. And actually, we've watched uh, both seasons uh, many times. Uh, the, even the second season, which we only discovered about three weeks ago, uh, we watched it right through, and then we watched it right through again. Uh, and so there's something in my unconscious, our unconscious, that wants to do that. And so that's transcending, and it's, uh, it's helping me understand my life from an individuation point of view. Okay, um, so, um, but I'm not going to get into the self here because that's that's like three or four volumes of Dr. Young's work, and so I want to finish uh, the um, uh, individuation today. So anyway, um, so. Point number six, under no circumstances 
Under no circumstances can individuation be the sole aim of psychological education. Before it can be taken as a goal, the education aim of adaptation to the necessary minimum collective norms must first be attained. If a plant is to unfold its specific nature to the full, it must first be able to grow in the soil in which it is planted. Um, so here, Dr. Jung is uh, addressing the issue of first living in, um, in the standards of your society. Let me get this off the screen here. And so, um, you know, the, this is why Jungian psychology is primarily about the second half of life now, except for some specific Jungians like um, Eric Neumann, who wrote a book called The Child Archetype, and uh, Marie-Louise von Franz, who wrote books about interpreting fairy tales. Um, most Jungian work is considered a second half of life activity. And so what Dr. Jung is saying here is, uh, first you have to learn how to be a human being. You have to uh, learn first how uh, not to have a bathroom accident when you're three years old. Um, and uh, then you have to learn that you have to go to school. And this is why uh, many children are crying uh, if they're at um, kindergarten because they, they're realizing that they're being torn away from the society that they've known for their whole life, namely being in close proximity to their mother. And, and so that's obviously a step toward individuation, but it's, it's a step of adaptation where mom says, uh, sorry, you have to go to kindergarten. That's your defeat. You can lament about it all you want, but you're going to have to figure out what you're going to be in your life. <laughs> and that's going to be your rebirth. And so kindergarten children do, um, you know, have a contest with their mother where they're uh, crying because they're fighting about being torn away. Uh, they're always defeated because mother always puts them into kindergarten. Um, and they lament about that. And then after they stop crying, they then look around because their self coming up, this life force drive, is telling them to look around and find something else that might be interesting to them because they're not going to have mommy anymore. And so that's one of the first uh, Job ar archetype cycles we all face. Um, and... Um, and those things go on, and um, when women are 12 or 13, somebody tells them that they're not going to be able to do all the things that boys do, and oh, by the way, they're also going to have to bear the children. Um, and I know a number of women that have told me that when they realized that, uh, they were quite angry. and. Uh, in a way, that's a, that's a defeat for the psyche, and one has to lament about it, can lament about it, but then you have to go on and learn how to be a woman. Uh, and by the same token, when Dr. Jung is talking here about uh, first you have to be able to grow in the soil in which you're planted, well, if you're a woman and you're born in Saudi Arabia, um, you better learn how to wear an abaya, uh, and you may not like it, but that's the way the society is. And so the first step is to learn uh, that you uh, have to wear an abaya all the time. Uh, but then what often happens when uh, Saudi women leave Saudi Arabia, and I've seen this many times, I've been there 23 times, probably spent six months in Saudi Arabia, um, a 
as soon as the plane takes off from a Saudi airport, whether it's Riyadh or Jeddah or wherever, um, the abayas go away. Uh, and because now they're in a different society. And so very often more modern uh, Muslim women aren't wearing the abaya by the time they're at 10,000 feet. And uh, they don't wear it again until they go back to Saudi Arabia where they put it back on again because they have to adapt to the society in which they live. Um, and uh, uh, by the same token, you know, uh, we would think it quite strange if an uh, American woman wanted to come to work as a cashier wearing a bikini. Obviously, they wouldn't. Um, and so maybe from a freedom point of view, they'd like to do so. Somebody might. But, um, you know, society, you have to adapt to societal standards, whatever they may be. Um, let's see. So I have a question here. Um, Everett says, do you think that astrology has any value for individuation? Um, I think it has value as a divination technique, um, very similar to the tarot. Uh, let me uh, be very clear about, um, about what I think about astrology or tarot. Uh, I don't consider them. I don't consider them wooey woo magic, at all. Um, I think, um, but they have developed in the collective unconscious over thousands of years, literally, and so they have a certain truth to them, and we cannot. Um, we can't put our finger on the truth. It's a little easier. I, I don't know astrology very well, honestly, uh, but I do know Tarot. And, um, you know, Tarot is very well put together at this point because uh, the way it develops is like evolution. Um, over the years, the things that work and have meaning to people survive, and the things that don't, don't. And so, uh, you know, probably women were uh, reading cards or tea leaves or something, um, you know, even probably 5,000 years ago at least, maybe longer. It may go, go back much farther than that. Um, and they learned what things were meaningful and what were not. And in the case of astrology, Dr. Jung was very interested in astrology and, and a very big point that comes up in, um, I don't have it immediately at hand, it seems. Um, there's a new book called um, uh, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, and it's uh, highly recommendable, and several of the uh, Jungian authors in there are talking about astrology, uh, and they point out that in the Red Book, the very first image that's in the Red Book that is contained in the um, stylized D as the first word, or the first letter of the first word of the Red Book, uh, does point to astrology. Now, why does he do that? The answer is that because these old storytellers told stories about what was in the heavens uh, for thousands of years. And those ideas entered the collective unconscious. And so whether you think anything of astrology makes no difference whatsoever because they do have impact. And when you read an astrology column, you can say, hmm, you know, they, that pretty well nailed it for me today. But the ones that don't nail it, you just forget about. And so it makes you wonder. But so anyway, there's something in the collective unconscious that's making uh, astrology relevant. It isn't because of where the earth is compared to um, Betelgeuse in the Orion 
nebula, not in, or in the constellation Orion, the upper left star is called Betelgeuse, and that star is something like a hundred thousand times bigger than our sun, I understand. It's a very big star. But its position in the heavens vis-a-vis -vis the Earth has absolutely nothing directly to do with your life, uh, unless it explodes, or let's say, unless it exploded a couple billion years ago, and we only find out tomorrow when the uh, gamma ray burst blows the atmosphere off, off the Earth, that could happen, but <laughs> the chances of that are very slim. Um, but other than that, there's not going to be anything because of the positioning of these stars in the heavens vis-a-vis uh, -vis the human idea of astrology. But from a storytelling point of view, from a collective unconscious point of view, those ideas developed in the human psyche uh, long before there was writing. And there was much interest in that. I mean, there's they've even found tablets uh, that were done by Sumerian astronomers uh, who described a comet or something, an asteroid that went across the sky uh, at the time of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. And they've demonstrated that that comet hit the Alps and created a great hole in the side of the Alps. It's identifiable. There's documentaries on this now. Um, so at, at the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, and I don't know when that was, it was at least like 4,000, 5,000 years ago. Um, yes, that was an actual event. Um, it was an astronomical event. It wasn't an astrological event. Uh, I don't, I doubt if it was predicted, although uh, some people may not have liked the um, social structure of those two cities. And so when that happened, they said, see, it's just like uh, uh, Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, saying that, you know, because People are bad in New York City. That's why we had Hurricane Sandy. Well, baloney. You know, that that's not true. <laughs> but there are enough people around who will believe that sort of stuff. And so in the case of astrology, this has been very broad and across the world for thousands of years. There were already 100 million people on the planet at 500 BC. So the population of the Earth was already quite large by then, and most of those human beings were probably telling astrological stories um, at that time. And those have only developed further as, as society and humanity has developed further. So anyway, that's my point about astrology. Um, okay, going on to... Um, Point six, under no circumstances can individuation be the sole aim. Oh, I think I did that. Um, okay, so we've done the collective norms. Point seven, individuation is always to some extent opposed to collective norms, since it means separation and differentiation from the general and a building up of the particular, not a particularity that is sought out but one that is already ingrained in the psychic constitution. The opposition of the collective norm, however, is only apparent since closer examination shows that the individual standpoint is not antigate, shows that the shows that the individual standpoint is not antagonistic to it, but only differently oriented. So um, my example for that, I pulled up a picture uh, to show you what I mean. Uh, this is Johnny Weir. So Johnny Weir um, was the U.S. figure skating champion uh, for three years uh, in the early 20-teens. And he is uh, today's flamboyantly gay 
and the hair that you see in this image uh, was twice as high in, in this year's when he was a commentator uh, in the U.S. Uh, figure skating championships in preparation for the Olympics. Um, and But Johnny Weir did comport himself with most aspects of the collective. In other words, he's an American man. He lives in the United States. He does many things the same as every other American citizen. Um, but he uh, chose to differentiate himself um, by uh, not only coming out, but coming out in a very flamboyant way. Um, and it works for him. He's uh, been hired as a television commentator and, and so he can be individuated. He is individuated. Um, but he's doing it within the collect. He's doing it within the collective. He's not saying that all Americans are bad just because um, he's he has some different aspects. Uh, but also, I wanted to mention that uh, yesterday uh, we saw the movie The Post, uh, and this is a movie about Catherine Graham and Ben Bradley at the time of the Pentagon Papers. And I urge you to see it because what you're seeing in that movie is a very clear example of individuation of Katherine Graham, uh, where she was adapted to her society, to her family, to her business, uh, to her social status and everything, totally ad adapted. And uh, she even talks about her adaptation and how she and her uh, husband used to spend time with both uh, JFK and LBJ. Um, and so they were totally adapted at the highest levels of American society. But uh, ultimately, she individuated quite dramatically uh, because despite pressure from every side, um, she published the Pentagon Papers, and um, she could have lost her business when she did that, um, but obviously she didn't, and what happened was that all the other major newspapers in the country carried the Pentagon Papers the very next day. They followed the Post, and so it was a fait accompli and a great victory for her. It's played by Meryl Streep, and I'm sure she's going to be nominated for an Academy Award for that. So um, it's um, she's a good example of how she's not antagonistic um, to her environment, but she was certainly differently oriented, and she understood the First Amendment rights of the U.S. Constitution differently than every one of the men that was trying to advise her uh, when she published the Pentagon Papers. So that's an example. Um, so you can be differently oriented, but you shouldn't be antagonistic. If you're antagonistic, you might want to try to find another country. <laughs> okay, um, going on. Uh, the next point is the individual way can never be directly opposed to the collective norm because the opposite of the collective norm could only be another but contrary norm. But the individual, but the individual way can, by definition, never be a norm. A norm is the product of the totality of individual ways and its justification and beneficial effect are contingent upon the existence of individual ways that need from time to time to orient to the norm. Okay, um, so obviously the point, the simple point is that if it's opposite from a norm that's been around for a long time, it's just going to be another norm. It's going to be different. Um, but individuation needs to reflect back on what the norms are from time to time and reorient. Um, and so that's what I'm expecting will happen in the American political 
society uh, going forward. Um, <clears throat> Okay, um, other questions here. All right, moving right along. Uh, a real con... Okay, so this is point nine. A real conflict with the collective norm arises only when an individual way is raised to a norm, which is the actual aim of extreme individualism. Naturally, this aim is pathological and inimical to life. It has accordingly nothing to do with individuation, which, though it may strike out on an individual bypath precisely on that account, needs the norm for its orientation to society and for the vitally necessary relationship of the individual to society. Individuation, therefore, leads to a natural esteem of the collective norm. And so... Um, I guess, since I'm alone here, um, in my group I've agreed not to talk about political issues, but since I wrote a book called Political Psychology, New Ideas for Activists, I guess I will uh, make a few political comments. Um, you know, throughout the last year and a half since, uh, or year and a quarter since, uh, Donald Trump was elected to be president of the United States. Um, he has basically taken a position that is opposite to almost every norm of our country. And I think that that is a fairly clear example of extreme individualism, extreme individualism. And, um, so here's Dr. Jung writing on this in 1921, 97 years ago, um, and saying that such behavior is pathological and inimical to life, and it may in fact be, because if, uh, if we have a war somewhere only because of pre the president's unique attitude about life, whether it be North Korea or whether it be Iran or what have you, um, people can really die. And so it is pathological. And so the true individuation is at some point coming back and reorienting to where the rest of us are and what our lives are about. And um, uh, and also developing this natural esteem for the collective norm. And so, so far, I've seen very little evidence that the President of the United States has any respect whatsoever for the collective norm of the United States, which is our constitutional law. And um, I think that that's very dangerous. And uh, it's not an example of individuation in, in any case, according to Dr. Jung. Okay, and point 10, um, but if the orientation is exclusively collective, the norm becomes increasingly superfluous and morality goes to pieces. The more a man's life is shaped by the collective norm, the greater is his individual immorality. Individuation is practically the same. Oh, I'll, I'll save that for a minute. But anyway, um, so the more a man's life is shaped by the collective norm, the greater is his individual immorality. Um, and so what this is saying is that the more we knuckle under to standards, the more our immorality comes out in other ways. Um, and, um, you know, there are examples in literature, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyder is an example, and there are many others, where the shadow simply 
comes up and takes over your life. And these things can be very powerful. If you, and so if, if you're totally normalized, uh, you're going to have the shadow, which is from your unconscious, trying to drive your life. And the, and the more normalized you are, the more uh, that's going to happen. Uh, Dr. Jung had a famous quote, uh, bring me a normal man and I will fix him for you. <laughs> because we all have to have a little shadow in our lives. Um, and so finally this uh, passage uh, concludes, Indivate, Indivate, <coughs> losing my voice again, Indivate, individuation is practically the same as the development of consciousness out of the original state of identity. It is thus an extension of the sphere of consciousness and enriching of conscious psychological life. Now, um, I put a, a reading from uh, Esther Harding on the YouTube channel about the three levels of consciousness, uh, which also comes up in Buddhism. And um, the first level is uh, the man of little, uh, the man of little intellect, and in the man of little intellect, they believe in everything is cause and effect. So if you do something, you're going to be punished for it. It's basically the law of karma. What comes around go, what goes around comes around, and so uh, when we're controlling people of little in intellect in the world, uh, we're controlling people who uh, need to understand things in terms of cause and effect. Um, then the middle level is a level in which you face the duality of life, in which you start to understand both sides of an issue. And so, in fairness to the president, um, if I look at his life and the various things that have happened to him, I can say, yep, yeah, if that had happened to me the way it did, I might well have turned out in exactly the same way as he did. I may, might have made the same decisions, and um, I don't know if I would be behaving the way he has in the last 12 months, but um, I would certainly have thought if I had been a person with all the experiences that he had, I would think that, yeah, I can become president of the United States and, you know, everybody will have to be at my beck and call and so on. And so that's my shadow side. And I recognize that it's there. So I have a view of it. And so the problem is in this middle level, um, you can you enter the field of the opposites. You start to recognize that everything has its opposites. And then you can be driven from pillar to post. And this is where danger comes in, um, as Dr. Edinger and others talk about, because they talk about the dangers of inflation or depression. And uh, certainly in the President of the United States, we see uh, the danger of inflation, where he has entered the field of opposites because uh, before he never had to worry about being in that field, but all of a sudden when he became president of the United States, he's all, all of a sudden having to deal with the fact that half the country or more uh, doesn't agree with him. And so he's being bounced back and forth on all these issues, which he's never thought about before. And um, so uh, the the next level of consciousness that individuate, you know, individuation occurs in that middle level and, and bouncing back and forth in the opposites. But then the next level is to rise above the opposites. And the Buddhists say that's a man of superior intellect. So that's a person who, uh, when something bad is happening, um, will 
put his mind above it and look at both sides of the issue and see both sides uh, right from the beginning rather than being pounded back and forth um, as our president is evidently right now. So anyway, that's uh, uh, that's where I am on that. Uh, so I've now read this uh, page and a half on individuation. Are there any other questions that anyone has on individuation? Um, Uh, Everett, very honestly, you asked the question, do you think astrology has any value for individuation? Um, I cer certainly think that there are values. I, because I'm not an astrologer per se, and I know very little about it, I don't think I can speak to that question very well, and I'll, I'll withdraw uh, from that particular question because I don't have anything to add about it. Um, and Shea, Lady Shea, Shea says, would this be grounds for ideological possession? Certainly, and there, um, a lot of what's happened in the United States is a possession. Um, we saw the worst case of it, of course, in uh, Germany and Russia in the 20th century, uh, where whole uh, countries were uh, totally destroyed and, and hundred well 50 million people were killed in World War II and the issue is when they um, when a archetype starts to play okay when it's activated constellated is the word used in Jungian psychology when an archetype begins to be constellated it doesn't stop it's like a uh, it's like a record um, it's, it's there from the beginning, uh, it's in the psyche, and once the archetype is activated, it doesn't stop until it's played all of its tunes. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, if you're a mother by any chance, uh, mothers, um, are mothers all their lives, it plays through. And, uh, so it is in, um, in the psychology of a nation. And uh, we, what we saw in Germany and Russia is that the archetype didn't stop until it played all the way through and until all the crockery was broken. Uh, the, the German men who fought in World War II uh, were totally possessed and couldn't be stopped. Their, their archetype was playing, and as long as it was playing, they couldn't be stopped until they were totally destroyed. The same with the Japanese and the same with the Russians. Um, okay, Jerome says, I just did the I Ching for Trump today. Preponderance for the great, uh, which shows a weak foundation on the verge of collapse. Um, yeah, I would say that that's very accurate. Um, you know, he had the opportunity to be a great president. He still does have that opportunity if he can wake up. Uh, unfortunately, I think he's too old to do that and he's too set in his ways and therefore he's not going to individuate. He's rather um, overwhelmed by what's happening to him archetypally and uh, he's not going to be stopped He's not going to stop until he is stopped. Of course, he theoretically will be stopped if he finishes his term. But my expectation is that um, he's, his uh, whole world is going to collapse very soon. Uh, because uh, what we see on television in the, all these discussions about uh, obstruction of justice, etc., uh, that, that's nothing. Uh, that, that isn't what Robert Mueller is worried about at, at the bottom. Um, yes, he might get prosecuted for obstruction of justice, 
the same as Al Capone got to, uh, prosecuted for tax evasion, and that's why he ultimately went to jail. But um, in terms of uh, uh, what's really there, in terms of all this mo mo money laundering and uh, also, um, you know, literally there there's treason in there someplace. I, I don't know if by the president, but certainly some people uh, have been traitors to the country in my view. And um, uh, I might be wrong. Robert Mueller might come out and say everything's hunky-dory. Could be. Uh, and he just wants to make sure of it. But I don't believe that's the case at all. His uh, silence is the thunderous, as they say. And so um, my expectation is that there is going to be some very serious political events in, in the next six months. Uh, <clears throat> what do I see as the most common obstacles to individuation now? Well, um, Sam Samuel, there's no obstacle to individuation. If individuation starts, it's not going to stop because you're going to be in this field of opposites and you're going to bounce back and forth until you can rise above it. Um, and so uh, perhaps individuation isn't for everyone. I mean, um, in the Buddhist sense, uh, the man of little intellect is the man who lives by karma, by the law of cause and effect. You know, that's 95% of everyone, probably. And this is how we teach our children. I mean, you know, the Catholic Church has, you know, you go in and you uh, uh, apologize to the priest and he gives you 10 Hail Marys and, and carry on type thing. Um, you know, that's a consequence. <laughs> and, um, and so a lot of people live in that world and are, continue to, but, but once people start to see the opposites, once they, like me, see that, well, yes, if I had been in Donald Trump's position throughout my life, I may have made very similar decisions to him. Uh, I don't know that I, you know, and so that's my shadow side. I know that it's my shadow side. It's not the way I live my life in the real world, but nonetheless, um, it's there, and um, once I know that and start to see uh, opposites, you start to see them everywhere, as a matter of fact, and, and then uh, you are individuating, and there's no choice. And um, uh, Dr. Young made a, an interesting comment. I'm not sure I can find it, but let me see if I can. <clears throat> I'm going to guess this is in uh, paragraph 746 of uh, Answer to Job here. I'm not very good at this yet because it's mirror image for me. Okay. So it's all about realization. To be individuated, you have to be more realizing your unconscious mind. And so let me just read a little bit of this paragraph 746 of Answer to Job. He says, The conscious realization of what is hidden, meaning unconscious, and kept secret, certainly confronts us with an insoluble conflict. At least this is how it appears to the conscious mind. But the symbols that rise up out of the unconscious in dreams show it rather as a confrontation of opposites. And the images of the goal represent their successful reconciliation. Something empirically demonstrable comes to our aid from the depths of our unconscious nature. It is the task of the conscious mind to understand these hints. If this does not happen, the process of individuation will nevertheless continue. The only difference is 
that we become its victims and are dragged along by fate toward that inescapable goal which we might have reached walking upright if only we had taken the trouble and been patient enough to understand in time the meaning of the noumena that cross our path. The only thing that really matters now is whether man can climb up to a higher moral level, to a higher plane of consciousness in order to be equal to the superhuman powers which the fallen angels have played into it, his hands. And so um, what he means is that we have to rise above these opposites. So when we think about American wars in the Middle East, for example, um, you know, exactly what do you think we as American men would feel if we had Muslim men camped out five miles from our house, um, even if they're just sitting in their cantonment right now training my army, you know, that I'm not sure that would go over so well in the United States. Um, and so that's a, a shadow issue. Um, and so if we understand that, then we say, oh, ho, well, maybe there, there's a reason why we ought to think about why we shouldn't have American troops in 200 countries around the world or whatever it is. Um, what do you, and um, Samuel asks about um, enantiodromia. Um, yes, uh, enantiodromia is in the center of Dr. Jung's oeuvre because his point is that whenever anything gets out of balance, it's going to rebalance, okay? And this is again the opposite. And so uh, enantiodromia literally means the tendency of things to turn into their opposite. And so uh, we see uh, what the United States is today, um, but the, whatever it is today, five years from now, 10 years from now, it's going to be quite different. And so uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how, these, how this enantiodromia plays out because uh, right now the, th the Republican Party thinks it's in the catbird seat, but what it's experiencing is an antiodromia where some of its members are starting to go over to the other side or to vote with the Democrats. This happened once, once before in at least Jerome's in my lifetime where uh, it used to be that the South was controlled by Democrats. Um, and, and so the people that were uh, very um, racist in their behavior, people like George Wallace, governor of Alabama, and Lester Maddox, who became governor of South Carolina, uh, they, they were Democrats. And, but over the period between the late 60s and early 70s, uh, there was a big shift. And so by the time, um, by the time Ronald Reagan came around, uh, the Republican Party took over the South and the Democratic Party took over the North. And so, um, so that sort of um, enantiodromia is occurring all the time. And uh, it's hard to imagine where we're going to be in election 2020. But anyway, we're, I believe we're headed back in toward the center because this, this um, uh, nonstop confrontation of the opposites just can't go on forever. It, ultimately, it's going to go back toward the center. And so that's my hope anyway. Um, so, any other questions? I've been talking now nonstop for uh, an hour and 55 minutes. And uh, if you have any other question, please ask it, or I'm going to pull the recording to an end, and we'll do it again next time. 
I hope it's been useful. I'm sorry my video didn't work. I'll try to work out how that does work in the future. Um, so thank you very much for watching and um, the replay of this should be available uh, on YouTube very soon. Talk to you soon.